Okay, so welcome Meg Atterbeck to this interview series showcasing HKISC's leadership. Thank you, glad to be here. Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to give a bit of a background, your professional background, you have a really special background. Um, so you studied at McGill University, then in the 1980s, mid 1980s, you went to China to study, you studied at China Renmin University, then you returned to the US and you got your JD from the Maryland School of Law. And then you started to practice in the US. You were a US litigator uh, for about 13 years altogether. Uh, and then in 2004, you became involved in international arbitration uh, at the firm that you were then with, uh, Thielen, Reed and Priest. And uh, you, you were working on a case, a long case for many years that took you all over the world to India, to South Africa, to China. And eventually in 2004, you moved to Shanghai and there you stayed uh, and uh, you stayed with Helen Reed and Priest. And then uh, you moved to uh, another firm, Pillsbury. And then you moved also to King and Wood Mallisons, uh, which is the firm that you are currently with. And now you're back in New York. Uh, your, um, your working languages are Chinese and English. Um, and you really specialize in uh, disputes between Chinese and non-Chinese par par parties. And uh, you've obviously gained uh, so much experience in terms of international dispute resolution in mainland China. Um, so I really want to explore some of those areas with you. Um, my first question is, you, what took you to study uh, in China in the mid 1980s and then to take you back to China later in the early 2000s to work? Um, so in 1985, I was fresh out of university and I had been studying Chinese for about six years, seven years at that point. And I sort of, not sort of, I was fascinated with Chinese language and Chinese culture. And uh, while I was in university, I got in my head that it would be interesting to do law in China because I was studying political science and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, Western company or countries and common law systems and you know, China's development of communism over the years and how does that all play out? Um, and I just thought it was fascinating. And it has proven to be fascinating for, I hate to say how many years now, from 85 to 2020. Um, but it, it really has, uh, it's been a lifelong passion in a way or interest. And that's the same thing that took me back. I mean, I wanted to stay in the US for a time to get a grip on the US legal system and really, when I got out of law school, there wasn't a lot of arbitration and litigation in China. So when I started to say, oh, I want to go back to China, people said, are you a corporate lawyer, right? Because that's what you did. You know, you did transactional work. So it took a while before there was enough uh, traction on the ground in China to have a need for someone like me. And I think you could even argue that when I did go back to Shanghai in 2005, there still wasn't that much of a need for someone like me. Um, but over time, I think it's changed. Yeah, so you've had a close relationship with mainland China since the mid 1980s through to now 2020. And there have been significant changes both within mainland China in terms of opening up and now in terms of going out um, and foreign direct investment outwards from China. And over that time, you must have seen incredible changes in terms of dispute resolution within China. Can you talk us through some of those, some of the evolution that you've seen over that time? Um, well, I'll just go from 2010 forward, or maybe 1998 forward, because that was when I first started going back to Beijing and was representing a Chinese company that had had some problems listed in the US. And, uh, you know, the perception of China and Chinese law and the court system uh, at that point was very much that it was rudimentary. And I don't think that was 100% wrong. I think we hadn't had the judicial reform that we saw, you know, in the past several years. We, we didn't have the evolution of the courts and, and the divisions within the courts of the financial courts and the IP courts, et cetera. Um, and you really didn't have the same uh, strength in terms of uh, judicial confidence and ability to go into the courts and know how the court system worked. I think it's really uh, so much different than it was 
back then, even in 10 years, I have to say that it's just a dramatic change. And then we look at arbitration in China. And as you know, um, you know, back in the earlier days, it was CTAC was it. And there were a lot of small arbitral institutions that you wouldn't even think of, frankly, as possibilities. And now you have, you know, Xi'ac in Shanghai, you've got the Beijing Arbitration Commission, you've got really up and coming and very solid arbitration commissions in addition to CTAC that, um, and I can't remember the number, some 144 other institutions. Um, and then of course we've had the evolution of international arbitration into China, uh, more foreign related cases, of course, by the Chinese arbitral institutions, but then, you know, the, the forays of, you know, the likes of HKIC in China um, where we're now able to set up, you know, we're looking at how would we run cases, if we were able to seat them there, what would that look like? Um, and certainly we're seeing uh, awards, both international awards being enforced in China, as well as awards that are, um, or rather arbitrations that are being, where the proceedings are taking place in China getting enforced. And so it's all sort of a positive trend. And a couple of years ago, uh, my team in Shanghai and I did a study on enforcement of awards and we were amazed, frankly, to find out that over time, um, really over a 10 year span, there had been, you know, only about 7%, on average, only about 7% of cases were ever turned down for enforcement, which I think most people have a perception in China that, um, you know, if you talk to an American company, oh, the deck's stacked against me, you know, I can't go into court, how could I ever win? Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that those notions have changed, you know, and that it's not, we're not all about Guanxi, you know, it is really a court system and a legal system and people understand it and navigate it every day. Mm. And so you, it's, it's dramatically different. Yes, I think the survey that you conducted is really useful um, because as you say, there are some perceptions around enforcement of foreign arbitral awards within China and that survey is really encouraging. Um, and then when you layer on the uh, reporting up system within China, you you have that extra sense of um, comfort that those decisions not to enforce are going to be taken by the Supreme People's Court, who are the highest court. Yeah. Yeah. And I do I think it's much more predictable than it yeah. was, than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, that, that's true of arbitration as well. Yeah. But I think for, uh, for the court system, I have a level, I work a lot now with clients who have cases in China where they've hit a stumbling block, you know, maybe some local, they, they think it might be local protectionism or some issues. And as it goes up, you know, to the provincial court or even to the Supreme Court, you begin to see, okay, how does, how does the court system work and how effective is it? And it really, it's, it's really changed. I mean, there's, you know, every legal system has a ways to go. I would say that in the U.S. as well these days. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's, it is different. Now you have to remember it's still a civil law society and you know, not heavily reliant on precedent and very much reliant on guidance from the Supreme People's Court. So that has implications for how case law or cases and rules are interpreted that we wouldn't necessarily have offshore. So it continues to be uh, a fascinating system because as a Westerner, maybe I don't entirely understand it, but I study a lot with my Chinese colleagues who do. So. Yeah. Um, traditionally, Hong Kong uh, as a seat in HKIC as an institution have been um, thought of very strongly as a, um, a super connector, both in terms of investment and trade and commerce, but uh, also in terms of dispute resolution between Chinese and non-Chinese parties. Um, of course, our caseload is, is much broader than that, much 80 over 80% of our cases are international cases and involve many parties actually from the US, but also from Europe. Um, you represent both Chinese parties and non-Chinese parties. Uh, what do you think that HKIC and the seat of Hong Kong, um, what do you think about its current status and what it brings uh, to parties uh, in your practice? So, I think Hong Kong continues, uh, despite recent events, I think it continues to be a, a great uh, place for arbitration. And I not, I recognize the challenges that we all face internationally and particularly in Hong Kong in the last 
couple years. I've had occasion actually to do sort of a deep dive recently on the implications of, you know, the basic law and the national security law and what is actually being in place. And from everything I've read, and nobody knows for sure, but from everything I've read, it seems to me like the judiciary has and will remain independent. Now, not everybody would agree with me, but I've had to do a fair amount of study of it because it's an issue that's come up a lot in the United States. So I actually continue to have confidence in the, the strength of the Hong Kong courts. And they have a tremendous history of being, you know, reliable, independent, and, you know, a great venue uh, in terms of your ability to apply not only Hong Kong law, but, you know, UK law as well, in terms of, you know, what, what you bring to the, the court system. For arbitration, I think, um, you know, it's a shame actually internationally that, uh, you know, when I talk about China and Asia Pacific in general and the US and even back a year ago when I was living in London, um, I'm always surprised at how little people seem to have an understanding of what we do and, and where we are and how we play in that, that region. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to educate people about why Hong Kong, why does it matter? How does it operate and why HTIC is an international arbitration center? And who goes to HTIC? I mean, it's a very diverse uh, case. You know, we have very diverse cases. We have very diverse tribunals. Um, and we're really able to serve stakeholders in a unique way. So trying to get Western companies familiar with uh, what's in Asia Pacific and what can be tapped in Asia Pacific is really important. And Hong Kong as a seat and as, you know, HKIC as an institution, it's a huge part of that. And I think with the interim measures arrangement uh, concluded last October, uh, it's all the more important for foreign companies to really understand what the advantages are to making that choice of Hong Kong as a seat, because it's a choice that comes along with really positive consequences that you will find in no other seat. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that uh, that is played enough in terms of having people understand the differentiator. You know, and my firm's done quite a bit of work in terms of it, using the, the arrangement and to, to advantage, frankly. And it seems to work quite well, despite its, its, you know, relatively short history. So, you know, having that in your back pocket and being able to go in and get injunctive relief or getting, you know, what is it effectively a preliminary injunction or, you know, a seizure of assets in order to secure a judgment. Um, you're not going to do that from anywhere else in the world. So, you know, when you're considering what clause to put into your contract, you really have to look at what's the nature of your contract and do you need that kind of relief? And a lot of companies do, frankly. And even if it's not, you want to go in and stop somebody's use of your IP, you may just want to be able to secure assets or evidence. And yeah. so those are very important factors when you're looking at where you want to go arbitrate. Absolutely. Significant advantages that, that companies should know about. Um, so I would also, not to cut you off, but I just also add, I think, you know, the bilingual, bicultural nature of HKIC sort of caters to both sides. And so yeah. you do have people like me who are actively involved, but then we have a lot of uh, Chinese arbitrators who, who also, you know, assist on the, and work on the China side to, to give the institution, I think, a fairly good blend of cross control and and bilingual capability um, that also is very unique. Yeah, no, that's absolutely essential to our work. Yeah. And I should say with the interim measures arrangement, we've seen 30 applications so far, we've seen by far the most. Um, and um, one thing that we see is it's not just foreign parties that benefit from the arrangements, it's also mainland Chinese parties that are applicants in many of these um, applications under the arrangement in respect of assets owned by foreign parties on the mainland. So it goes both ways. Yeah, it is not just an attack on the Chinese assets in mainland China. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we trace those, <laughs> that information. Where the shoes on the other foot, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you, you were appointed to council, our HK, HKIC council last year in March 2019. And then in June last year, you were appointed to our appointments committee. And uh, 
you know, as an institution, the appointments that we make, it's one of the most important functions that we undertake. Um, so first of all, thank you for all of your work on that committee. Um, but I wanted to get your take on, on you know, you see that in, in the workings of HKIC, you see our appointment process, you see what we do in each case. What's your, what's your takeaway from, from what you've seen during that work? I've learned a tremendous amount, and I thank you and the council for the opportunity to do it, actually, because the work is a pleasure. I, I think there's two pieces to it. I think it's interesting because we, we have the mission and intentionality when it comes to how are we going to put together the best panel and the best list uh, that allows young arbitrators to come up, that recognizes women and diversity and, and incorporates, you know, whether it's arbitrators from you know, states in Africa or somewhere in Turkey or Russia or whatever. Um, we're constantly pushing that uh, mission and that agenda to be diversified. Yet at the same time, we have another uh, more urgent task every day, which is how do we serve our stakeholders? And so, as you well know, on the appointments committee, um, it isn't just that we sit back and, and, you know, spin the wheel and pick a name. It's a very deliberative process and takes a lot of effort. And I think that it's what's great about it is that it really does work hard to meet the expectations of stakeholders. So parties come to us and they say, we'd really like to have someone who's bilingual, who knows PRC law, you know, who's also part in Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera, and is an engineer, whatever. Um, <laughs> we, we go through and seriously look and say, this person would be good, but this person, you know, maybe not as good a fit, et cetera. But it is, uh, it's a very catered process. And so it's an interesting dynamic between trying to meet the expectations of stakeholders while at the same time as an institution wanting to be inclusive and to add more arbitrators into the mix that diversify who the pool is and, and create you know, increasingly more robust tribunals with good experience. And so it's been fun to watch and fun to work on it. Um, and hopefully most of the time, knock on wood, we succeed. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's, um, it's interesting. It's been a yeah. great, great process, really. Yeah, I think you've described it very well in, in terms of identifying the different objectives that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And um, hopefully we are. I mean, I'd like to think we are, so. Yeah. And I think the, the, the special thing about an institution is you have such a good vantage point because we make our appointments, but then we also see how the tribunals run their cases, and that's really an important information to follow up on. Yeah. yeah, and I think the tribunals worldwide are evolving, you know, and it'll be interesting to see, too, you know, how the Zoom environment, so to speak, and the new normal uh, changes how we select arbitrators and, you know, people that you wouldn't pick before if they're willing to be up all night, which I tend to be, um, you know, they're it works. And so, you know, query what impacts that that's going to have on what the stakeholders actually demand. So we'll, we'll see in the next five years what it looks like. Yeah. Um, we hear a lot these days about US China tensions. We're in an election year. <laughs> um, you know, as someone who has worked with Chinese parties and with US parties for so long, you know, both sides. Um, I wanted to get your take, not so much on the tensions that we hear about all the time, but how you see US and Chinese companies complement each other and interact in business and, and whether you see um, any changes, any real changes in that space uh, in the recent past or what's, what's your take on, on the reality on the ground between US and Chinese parties? Yeah, I think I'm definitely on the bleeding edge of that these days. <laughs> okay. um, but it's, I still firmly believe, and if you look at what's going on in China, we don't see a reduction in our M&A deal flow, frankly. Um, we're, you know, obviously everybody's affected by COVID, but on the whole, business is still going on, despite sanctions and TikTok and WeChat and whatever is coming up on the U.S. agenda, you know, day by day. Uh, the reality is the companies still want to do business and there are sectors where we all need each other. And I don't think, you know, the current agenda, I think in the U S is to stop the flow of data. 
and there's a concern about security around data. And I think what where we've all gone awry maybe is that, uh, you know, my personal view is that commerce and science should drive policy. And I think what we're having is politics and policy try to drive commerce and science. And it's not working very well, whether that's as it relates to climate change or as it relates to, you know, uh, how data flows between the two countries and how we manage those issues. I think that whether that's through a, an app or a underground cable or whatever it is, or subsea cable, whatever. Um, but I think that the, you know, we're going to continue to have these challenges because there's going to be competition. It should be fair and open competition and it shouldn't be regulated by sanctions or export controls on either side. Um, you have to have regulatory mechanisms. We all know that, but those shouldn't be tools for the various countries to stack the deck one way or the other. It should be, you know, business as usual and let, let the market evolve and let companies work together. And right now there's a disadvantage to not having a free flow of information and data because historically Chinese and U.S. companies were learning from each other and working together and collaborating. I actually think in COVID times, we'd be much more advantaged right now by having a more collaborative environment in pharmaceuticals, you know, and, and clinical research than we've been able to have because of some of the political tensions. So I think on a lot of different layers, um, it's important that, you know, science and commerce dominate. Um, but I think on the whole, you know, because of the nature of markets and how globalized everything was before all this happened, that it's still happening. People are still going to work. They're still doing business. I still, I just got off the phone last night in fact, with a head of a US company that was going to China and was asking me how long do I have to quarantine and I need to get back. And, and so people are trying to get things done. And so my view is there's a lot of complementary aspects and we need to focus on that and try to push ahead. Well, we'll thank see. you. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you very much, Meg. Your insights are really, really interesting. Um, it's great to have you on council. It's great to have you on the appointments committee. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I look forward to working with you. And I know I speak on behalf of all of the secretariat. So thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Sarah. And actually, I wish I was in Hong Kong with you today. So oh, next, yeah. next time we'll do it across the table. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Take care. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.